Hi, everybody. We are going Hi. live today um, with our topic of essential factors contributing to being highly successful after weight loss surgery. So, hello. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome, everybody. We're so happy you're here. We're, um, we've been just kind of getting set up. So I, I we're kind of on here about a minute late, but we are ready to go. And honestly, this topic I kind of came up on when we were looking for topics for this month for June. And I thought, you know, like what does make someone more successful? There's no answers. Um, specifically when you're running a program, like some of you out there uh, may have programs, but there are specific characteristics that like post-surgery that can be super helpful. So that's what we're going to be kind of focusing in on the characteristics, um, the actions that people do after surgery to help them be more successful. So we'll do a little brief introduction. Go ahead, Brittany. I'll let you go first. Hi everyone. I'm, my name is Brittany. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I. Uh, I started with ProCare in about August and Brennan and I started doing these live events about a month or a month or two after, I think. So we have quite a bit of these live events that we've done. And in case you're new, we do them every Wednesday at the same time, one o'clock uh, Central Central Standard Time. And uh, we also, we depending on what platform you're watching this on, we actually do them on Crowdcast and Facebook simultaneously. And Brenda, just so you know, Facebook is working. So we yes. did something right today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Thank God. So um, if you guys have any questions, uh, please make sure that you ask a question. Use the either ask the question feature in Crowdcast or hi, GC. Hi. <laughs> um, or you can, you, you know, just ask it in the chat feature and... Um, if you're on Facebook, just comment on this video and I'll make sure that we do our best to uh, get that answered for you. But anyway, so yeah, my name is Brittany. Um, I started off doing some marketing work for ProCare <coughs> Health and then ever since then, our both of our roles have progressed, I'd say quite a bit over the past year. So um, Brennan and I do these lives. We also do monthly support groups too for anybody who um, may not know that yet either. We do them the third Thursday of every month. And it's over various different topics. And um, same thing with the live events. Those are replayable. So if you ever missed one, we have a bunch of different topics that we go over every Wednesday. And if you missed one that you'd like to catch up on, you can go to our Crowdcast channel and watch the replays on there. Um, and I believe they can watch the replays on Facebook too. So, Yeah, yeah. And we can share a link. I don't know if you have access to that yeah. maybe. Uh -huh. That would be I'll pull wonderful it up. to our Crowdcast channel. If you follow us, you get notifications about 10 or 15 minutes before our program starts. So um, it's a good little reminder. And then you can use that same link for the reminder to go back and listen to a replay if you can't listen live with us. So, um, and for those of you who may be joining for the first time, my name is Brenda and I came up on ProCare probably seven or eight years ago. I worked for a bariatric surgery program as a coordinator. And we sold ProCare vitamins through our clinic. And so I just became familiar with the products. I came in love with the, the, the ProCare family and um, just became part of their more permanent team here recently about a year ago, like Brittany said. Um, I'm a nurse. I'm also a bariatric surgery patient and um, hope to bring some of, some of that experience in as we're talking. So let's just kind of get started. I think um, when it comes to having weight loss surgery, the surgery is only, um, I'd say, a small part. You know, it's uh, about losing and then also maintaining that weight loss. Sometimes people come into surgery and one of the biggest questions they have is, is this maintainable? Because that's like one of their biggest fears. And I know it was one of my biggest fears, you know, is it maintainable and sustainable over time? So when you look at um, those success stories and like looking at one person over another, um, it's the behaviors. Okay. And the overall lifestyle changes that those people incorporate in that 
can make the most difference with their lifelong transformations. Um, and it can be somewhat of a roller coaster ride. So there's days, you know, you may feel on top of the world and feel like this is going well. And then there's days that maybe you gain a pound or two or even more, or you find yourself kind of relapsing back into some of the old patterns and behaviors. So, um, what I'd say is when you're looking at this overall, if you are able to kind of focus, especially that first year, or even if it's after that first year on specific types of patterns that, um, and look at those and maybe address those that maybe not serving you well, if you are finding success or you're not finding success. So we're going to focus on the ones that, um, people have, uh, found to have the best success in. And so there was a study done that I found and it incorporated about 115 participants. Okay. And those people that were five or more years post bariatric surgery. And this study was done. Um, basically I'm looking here for the actual placement. Let me look at my resources here at the Stanford University School of Medicine, okay? And it was done by them and Bariatric Support Center International. And what they looked at is um, six basic elements or characteristics that people were very strong in and being highly successful after su surgery. So what they were kind of measuring that on was to find those highly su successful, <laughs> getting mm -hmm. tongue tied, were those with greater than 80% excess weight loss, okay? Um, and those not so successful, less than 40% excess weight loss. So, you know, the normal for a lot of people for like, let's say a bypass is um, being 75% or above, I'd say on average, maybe somewhere in there um, on the sleep gastrectomy, 50 or 60% excess body weight loss. Um, lap band may be a little less than that. And then when you're looking at the duodenal switch, a lot of those people can be pretty high, 75, 80% excess weight loss. Um, they're not defining in the study what types of surgeries were done. You know, they're not specifying these were all gastric bypass patients or sleeve. I'm sure there's a mixture in the study. Uh, but um, what we're going to be like looking at is the percentage of those highly successful, meaning the percentage of greater than 80% excess weight loss. And like, what does that mean, excess weight loss? That is just a number basically that's thrown out there. Um, so if you're, let's say you're 250 pounds before surgery and your ideal body weight is, I'm just gonna say 150. And so that's 100 pounds overweight. And so timesing that by, you know, percentage, um, like let's say you lose 100, 100 pounds, that means you'd have 100% excess body weight loss. If you lost um, 80 pounds, that would be 80%. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Are you following me, Brittany? Yeah. I'm hoping other people are too. Any comments so far? Not that I see. Um, I mean, GC said hi. Thanks for joining again, by the way. Yes. <laughs> well, we love you being here with us. It's extra support on our end. And if you find things too, GC, because I think they, I mean, I know you work for, it's Gwen. I know you work for a facility as well. If you find things that we're sharing here, please also feel free to share because it may help somebody else. Do you have anything to add before I kind of go on, Brittany? No, not yet. I was just kind of looking at the comments on Facebook too, making sure we don't have anybody. Okay. And I'm on my phone, so I apologize. I kind of have my phone kind of balancing on something. So it's a little bit less stable than my computer, but, but we're making this work. Um, the very first thing I share with our SG UF health at chance. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. We appreciate that. I think Florida, right? I'm thinking we'll wait for her, um, to respond. And so, yes, gators. <laughs> so, um, so wonderful. So let's kind of just dr drop in. Let's first, we're going to talk about nutrition. Okay. Um, the very first one that the category wise that we're going to be kind of like looking at is behaviors under nutrition. So, um, percent, like if most of your calories are coming from protein and those highly successful was 49% of those participants 
and 36% with not so highly successful. So that is a key behavior, eating your protein, making sure you're getting that in first, focusing in on that. You know, for most people, that's 60 to 80 grams of protein a day. For some types of procedures, it may be even a little higher, like the duodenal no switch. Um, the next thing is percent of calories from carbohydrates, and that is 31% versus 40%. So, um, meaning that the people who had the most weight loss were actually focusing more on, um, less on carbohydrates and more on protein. Um, same with fat, kind of the, the fat actually was, it was about 20% highly successful and 22% not so successful. So it wasn't a big difference there, mm -hmm. but just a little bit by 2%. And then eating high sugary foods at least once daily. Now this one's pretty surprising. I was going to say that's a big uh, difference. Yeah. 9.3 <clears throat> versus 40%. Um, and I wish I could copy and paste this into a browser. Brittany, do you have your document open? Yeah, I do. I don't know how it would post in chat, but we could post it. And then eating at um, high food, at fast food restaurants at least weekly, 54 versus 65. 54 meaning the people less. It's less. They're eating less there, eating less out. And then eating in front of a TV at least once weekly. And that is 43 versus 67 percent. I so went ahead and, and pasted it in the uh, chat. Oh, thank you. So so in summary, under nutrition, those people who are the most successful are eating high protein diets that are lower in carbohydrates and lower in fat, lower in sugar. And they're spending more time eating at home or bringing food along rather than eating out. And also eating in front of the TV is not necessarily is a less behavior like they're not they're being more mindful about where they're eating and, and, and how they're eating. So the and next that makes one. sense too, because um, we did a live event with Katie Chapman, who's a registered dietitian. And uh -huh. she said, when we were talking about protein, that uh, that's what some people all struggle with the most is how to get, you know, all that protein in one day. And she said that that's really key to your weight loss. So I know that she had, she had mentioned that too. I wanted to throw that in there. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think too, I think some of these behaviors like that first year, right after surgery, I think some of these just come so easily, mm -hmm. you know, um, you're making huge changes. You're excited. You're you're motivated and you see the changes, the weight coming off. And then, like I said, it's easy to get back into the old patterns of, mm -hmm. of, of changing, you know, those lifelong patterns of how you've eaten your whole life and that type of thing. Um, the next one here is fluid intake. So there's two under that category. One of them is drinking ca carbonated beverages. And that one is surprisingly different, like 7.5% on the highly successful versus 27% on the less successful. So that's a big factor. And then excess mm -hmm. caffeine is 27.1% in the highly successful versus 48.6% in the less successful. So in summary of those two, basically what that's, saying is that those people who drink less carbonated beverages and excess caffeine um, tend to be a little bit more successful. And I wonder, you know, maybe that's just because they're really aware of what they're putting in their bodies and being, again, really mindful of it. Uh, so those are. You're still there. Wait, I'm yeah, still you're here. still okay. there. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. It's showing low, it's okay. low power, but I have, I'm plugged in. So I'm going to look at it one more time here. Okay. I'm going to check my connection. I think today is just a day with technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. While she's doing that, um, I was just going to say that uh, probably a part of the reason why people are, uh, not leaning towards carbonated drinks though too is um 
it can cause dumping syndrome too. Mm -hmm. And if you did that once, hopefully you learn your lesson and you don't do it again. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, also, I think that the all the all liquid diet kind of helps you prep for that too, and getting your, that liquid in or that fluid intake that you need in. Yes, most definitely. I'm going to try my connection in a different place here too, to see. <laughs> I am almost have to laugh at myself because <laughs> this has just been it's just been interesting. We'll just put it at that. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, try this. Can you still hear me, Brittany? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Try this again. Okay. The very next one is portion control. Can you still hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So portion control meals. It just keeps popping me on and off. I'm just, I'm just uh, being a little crazy here, guys, I guess. Um, so portion control. So meals, meal portions too large versus, versus, um, you know, not, not so large or being appropriate size. And that this is probably one of the biggest differences I see on all of these statistics. 9.3% um, in the highly successful, they, they tend to eat, meaning they, they tend to eat two larger portions versus 52.6% in the not so successful. So that what that's saying is, is that um, those people who are really mindful of what they're eating, it's, um, it makes a difference basically. <laughs> okay. And how much they're eating too. Yeah. How much you're eating. Yes. Okay, next vitamin supplements. So here we're talking about multivitamins for and calcium and iron. And those statistics, pretty big differences as well. 82% versus 56% on um, 82%, meaning they're taking their vitamins versus 56.8% on the not so successful. So they're um, getting their vitamins in. Calcium 75 versus 43% on the 75% on the successful versus 43 on the not so successful. And these are just a lot of numbers I'm throwing out here. But so in summary on that, multivitamins and calcium. People who are successful are taking their vitamins and making sure their body stays healthy. And they're, um, I guess it could, in results, it could be contributing to like their metabolism and overall like physical health. And once again, that's a really high number too. I mean, 82%, that's... I mean, that's pretty crazy. That says a lot too for someone who, um, if you're one of those people that skips on taking your multivitamins, I mean, it's proof that it really does help with your, with your weight loss journey. So, and, and it's, I mean, it's good for your body too, but, <laughs> um, it actually does help you lose weight though, too. So. And then personal accountability, we have weighing daily support group attendance and attending surgical follow-ups. And all three of those are higher percentages. Um, I can go through each one individually. I can um, share it. Yeah. 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 Weighing daily is 35.7% uh, versus 7.3. Um, so higher on the people who weigh daily. Now, I've heard, I've talked to two dietitians um, recently who weren't so big on the weighing daily. So I would say it depends on if it begin, becomes a, um, how can I say this, obsession where you feel like that you have to weigh, you know, to be able to feel good about what you're doing. We talked about this in a prior support group and it's, I think it just depends on everybody. Everyone's different. I mean, I'm, I'm talking specifically on the weighing in every day. Some people felt like they really had to. It's kind of um, a daily ritual that they do, and it's just how they start their morning. And I think that's fine. But like, Bre like Brenda said, if you become obsessive over it, and it's really um, wearing down on your on your mental health, then maybe try and do it once a week or twice a week instead of every single day. Because 
Another thing is just because you didn't see a difference on the scale from today and tomorrow doesn't mean that there won't be from Monday to Friday. Yeah. A week weighing once a week or weighing once a month, sometimes you can see more differences overall. For sure. Because there's differences every day, you know, like water weight, water retention, depending on um, your your bowel habits, that kind of thing. If you're female, menstrual cycles, um, hormone levels. I mean, we retain more fluids at different periods of time in our life. And uh, another thing that we talked about, too, is some people really don't like getting on the scale at all. And there's other ways to track your progress too. You can take before and after photos, which I know people really love those because it really does show, I think, in photos very well. And also measurements too. Get a tape measure and just measure yourself around your waist. Um, where else? I mean, not anywhere that you really want to, I guess. But measurements yeah. can say a lot more than... Um, than the number on the scale can too. Like Brenda was saying, it could be water weight, it could be inflammation. So yeah, just find different ways to do it. I wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, and the measurements part, I know. Um, and GC, did GC did say we recommend weekly ways too at their program. So I'm sorry, Brenda, what were you saying? Oh, I, I'm glad you brought in her comments. Uh, I was just gonna say that Oh, uh, now I lost my train of thought. Um, Sorry. <laughs> oh, measurements. We're talking about measurements. Yeah. We always did when we did measurements for the program I work for. Mm -hmm. We did around the neck, like right here, around the chest, around the waist, around the hips. You know, you could even go so far as doing the both the arms, both arms around the biceps. Mm -hmm. um, or thighs. Or thighs. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it's amazing because people, one of the very first places that they notice a big difference, even though it's so slight as far as inches, is their face. Uh, yeah, I could see that. You know, taking mm -hmm. close-up photos of your face, not just your body, because um, when you lose weight in your face. Now, it's interesting, too, when we would do measurements, people would say, oh, I, I'm just losing it. I'm just losing it in my chest, you know, it's a female, and jokingly, but also they also were serious about it and if you look at though if you look at the overall measurements if you're doing all of those measurements you'll find that really they coincide like maybe two inches here so many inches around the waist as you're losing you're actually losing in other places but it may just feel like you're focused it just feels like it yeah <laughs> um and then i think it's interesting under this personal accountability is the attending of the sort support groups so i mean you guys are here you're in the right right place right now that's 40 percent on the highly successful versus 13 percent in the not so successful so that's that's pretty cool and then the surgical follow-up you know with your programs to me people um people tend to get more support whenever they're going to their follow-up appointments and sometimes people get scared you know at some point because maybe they've gained some weight back or something's happened um, sometimes that's a reason for a non-follow-up or sometimes it's, it's, it's simply like a change of insurance and that type of thing. If you can't follow up with your surgical program, find somebody you can follow up with a primary care doctor or something like that is even helpful. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, we did a support group for, um, I don't remember which facility it was, but we did it with the coordinator and she said that if you feel uncomfortable coming to a follow-up appointment because you lost weight, then that should give you even more reason to go to that follow-up appointment because maybe there's something that you're missing that they could that they could help you with and um, you know help you lose that weight that you want or if you're hitting a plateau and you maybe need some help, reach out to your bariatric facility and schedule a follow-up appointment and make sure you go because. I, I don't know. I just thought the way she put that, it made so much sense to me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I I think um, they want to be, those people want to be helpful. They're there. That's what their jobs are. And, and really, they want you to succeed. Them. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so let's kind of, let's kind of, I got, I got one more, one more um, type of category and that's physical activity. Okay, so physical activity being um, aerobic or strength training, okay, both of those. The successful 
um, here were much higher um, percentages than the less successful on the aerobic exercise. We have 44.1% versus 13.5% on the not so successful. And then on the strength training, 40.2% versus 26.6% on the not so successful. So overall, I'm going to kind of go over those behaviors one more time. And then we're going to talk about a few other things real quickly here too. On the nutrition, um, some of the characteristics of somebody who's highly successful would be getting most of their calories from protein, um, less from their carbohydrates, less from fat, focusing on um, less sugary foods, trying not to eat out as much, you know, being mindful of where you're eating, whether it's in front of the TV or, you know, out with friends and that type of thing. Um, the next thing is fluid intake and that's drinking carbonated, not drinking, I'm sorry, not drinking carbonated beverages or excessive caffeine amounts, um, under the portion controls, eating appropriate portion size, not eating too large proportions under vitamin and supplements. It's, um, taking the multivitamin and your calcium supplements, you know, on a regular basis. Uh, under personal accountability, it's about weighing daily or weekly or monthly, just kind of keeping track of your weight. I think this study did specifically on daily, but really just kind of tracking where you are so that you can mm -hmm. see if you're upward progressing or downward progressing. Because sometimes when we get scared, you just drop off the wagon completely. Um, attending support groups and attending surgical follow-up appointments. And then under regular exercise, we have um, doing some type of aerobic conditioning three or more times a week and strength exercises um, three or more times per week. So those type of things. Any other comments? Not uh, yet. Okay. Okay, perfect. So the next thing we're going to talk about is avoiding complications. Okay. And in avoiding complications, there's a couple things that we're going to kind of talk about with that. And that is, um, certain medications that can cause issues, smoking, alcohol intake, um, overall. So the first thing, medications. So medications, NSAIDs, which are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications can be beneficial for pain control. And a lot of people who undergo weight loss surgery uh, are on some type of NSAID because of inflammation in their joints, inflammation in their back, just I would just say in general <laughs> that a lot of people um, who have weight problems, you know, struggle with other types of, of joint or pain issues. So after surgery, finding something you can take, um, there are medications that are lower risk. Now in the category NSAIDs, I want to go back to and say that's things like ibuprofen, naproxen, mm -hmm. cele Celebrex, um, endomethacin, um, higher dose aspirin. I wouldn't count really low dose aspirin into this doctor. It varies doctor to doctor, but most doctors will allow their patients to take low dose aspirin after surgery, especially if they're on them before surgery. Um, but things that are higher, higher risk. Sorry about that guys. Okay. Can you see oh, me again? Please? Yeah, I, I can. can out for a second. Um, I'm going to kind of I'm going to kind of um, move a little quickly just in case I do end up cutting out here because my phone, um, I'm having, um, I plugged it in, but I'm still having some issues with that. I think it's just me overall here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, but it's just me overall. Next thing is smoking. And um, so smoking, smoking is, you know, one of those things I usually recommend quitting before surgery. Not all surgeons are say that you have to. Some will say, well, if you do this surgery, you're okay. If you do another surgery, you're not. Um, but some do say, some will say exclusively, every patient needs to quit smoking and st stop quit smoking. The reason being is they're not trying to be mean. They just want to um, have best outcomes. And what can happen after weight loss surgery is you can have some irritation to that stomach lining. And so smoking can increase your risk of that irritation, increase your risk of ulcers, decrease your risk of healing. And so that's the big reasons for smoking.
And then the last one here I have is alcohol intake. And I would say, you know, in general, a lot of programs will recommend stopping alcohol for a period of time. Sometimes it's a brief period, like six months. Sometimes it's a year. Um, some surgeons will actually say they don't want their patients ever, ever drinking. So, I mean, it depends on a program. Some of those things are the same, the same, you know, it, alcohol can, um, it can increase your risk of irritation to the stomach lining, increasing your risk for ulcers. It also can lead to extra weight gain because of the um, extra calories that you're taking in. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's also a cross, uh, addiction. And that just means that sometimes people, instead of eating, will drink instead, you know, it's kind of a, can be an addictive behavior. And so kind of avoiding those type of things. I'm trying to think if there was anything else, you know, really, um, after surgery, you can be a lot more susceptible to getting drunk <laughs> because yeah. it's, it's your body absorbs that alcohol much more quickly. And so um, what can happen is, is it can be that you drink and you, you're a cheap drunk, basically <laughs> you drink and you can get drunk more easily. Well, and if you think about it, your, your portions are going to be smaller now too. So you're eating less food. And if you're drinking the same amount of alcohol that you were when you were, I don't know, eating more food, um, mm -hmm. you're, it's just, your body's not going to process it the same. Absolutely. So, I mean, really with all of this, um, just overall the decisions and the choices that you make affect today, but they also affect tomorrow. Sometimes it's hard for us to realize that, you know, we just see short term, um, not knowing what our choices right now, how, what, what happened, what those lead to in the future. So, mm -hmm. um, choose wisely and those that can help with your best outcome is what the advice is of this little, little segment today. <laughs> and I'm looking to see if there's anybody, anybody have any comments regarding any of this? Nope. Uh, I mean, we had a couple of comments. So Tina said, good afternoon. And I already said hi to her and this new setup is not good. Just saying, <laughs> uh, Facebook changed the way it was set up. Um, Jackie said, thank you for these videos. They help out a lot. You're very welcome. We love making these. So how much should I actually be eating at this point? Um, I'm trying to see if she said how post how far she is. Um, she also, we had another question while I'm trying to find out, uh, Jackie, Lisa said, what about sugar intake? How many grams per day? Do you have any idea for that, Brenda? I'm thinking on it here for a second. As far as sugar itself, I don't really know that there's an actual number, but I would just say, you know, your sugar is carbohydrates and you have differences in the types of carbohydrates you mm -hmm. take in, you know, complex versus simple sugars. So complex would be things like um, multi-grains. Uh, it would be things like um, certain types of breads that are um, high in fiber and, um, high in certain types of grains are not as processed, I guess. Whereas your simple sugars would be things like icing off of the cake or cake, um, sugary candies, that kind of thing. So there's a little difference. I mean, sweet potatoes or potatoes are considered a com more of a complex mm -hmm. carbohydrate than a simple carbohydrate or simple sugar. So maybe just not so much in numbers, but just like looking at the types of carbohydrates that eating, you know, vegetables are a type of carbohydrate. Some of them are, and, um, some of them are a little bit more complex than others. I hope that, um, that's kind of a generic answer, but I was, I just wanted to add to that also drinking too. A lot of fruit juices have a lot of sugar in them mm -hmm. too. Um, 
and even some Gatorades, like sports drinks have a lot of sugar in them too, depending on what kind you get. I know they have the, they make the zero sugar ones, but uh, yeah, it's not just the, it's not just foods. Make sure that you're paying attention to what you're drinking too. Mm -hmm. And Jackie wanted to know uh, how much should she be eating now that she is nine months post-op? I wonder what surgery she had. Does she say? Jackie, would you mind commenting on and letting us know what surgery it was? So, I mean, everybody's a little different and I don't know what she's like referring to as far as portion sizes. I would say um, like half your plate could be vegetables. A fourth should be protein. A fourth should be those um, starches, those more complex carbohydrates. So if you're drawing a plate, a circle, again, half vegetables, a fourth protein, a fourth um, starchy, more starchier foods that sustain you. She and had gastric bypass. Gastric bypass. And portion size, I mean, if you're looking at probably a smaller plate, you know, maybe um, two ounces maybe of protein, two to three ounces. Three ounces would probably a little even on the high side, depending on what kind you're having. Um really by now at nine months, you're on, I would say a maintenance diet, you know, one that's going to be more sustainable long-term. You probably don't have a whole lot of restrictions unless there's things that you can't eat yourself. She did specifically ask, she said a cup of food or two cups of food. So I think she's just, you, you kind of answered that when you said the, uh, ounces. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of hard because everybody's bodies are just a little differently. Uh, if you're like really, really wanting to know those amounts, I would suggest talking to somebody from your bariatric program and having them work with you like a dietitian or something. But in general, I mean, you still are probably going to have a lot of restriction even during that first year. So, I mean, I hate to even throw out numbers because it can be so different for different people depending and on. And everybody's different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and really if you sit down and you eat within like a 30 minute of time, 30 minutes of time, you're eating slowly and you're chewing your food well and all of that, um, you should be feeling full and sustainable for a while. Uh, you know, sometimes because meal sizes are so small, sometimes people will, um, tend to maybe even graze a little bit between meals and there's nothing wrong with that but just enough food to kind of keep you satisfied to the next meal instead of having a whole nother meal in itself. And also I wanted to add quickly to that, um, make sure that you're not eating and drinking at the same time too still, because that can actually um, push the food through and it can make you feel hungry sooner mm -hmm. and not as full longer. Yeah. Yeah. Because the water fills your, your pouch up and then you're, you can't, you know, get food in there. And then, <laughs> and then also it does also make things, it's like a funnel. It makes things go basically, it just pushes it through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. uh, let me double check and see if we have any more questions. Okay. Um, she said, I feel like I can eat a lot. I'm not dumping. Well, that's good that you're not um, having any of those symptoms or anything. And I would wonder too, if her weight loss, if she's concerned with her weight loss, if she's still losing or if she's stalled or if she's at her goal, that type of question would be a good question too. Yeah. Because you know, if, if you aren't at your goal yet, I would say keep doing what you've been doing. I mean, as long as you're losing and if you haven't, then start keeping track of what kind of foods you've been eating and how much of it and maybe keep a journal or um, you can use an app for that too. Mm -hmm. And then you can adjust it too. Mm -hmm. um, you can adjust it week by week because uh, by just giving a g generic numbers that fit everybody, that's not always the best fit, you know? Um, yeah. Like look what you're doing and then adjust it appropriately. And it looks like Michael has a comment too. He said, super hard to answer about 70 grams of protein daily. Listen to your body. Stop when satisfied. Don't try to squeeze it in the last few bites of a portion if you are full. And, you know, that's... that's I would agree. Good. 
you know, um, we were talking about, we're going to be talking about habit changers, um, here coming up on one of our Facebook lives. It's, um, one of our topics in July, we have a two part series on that. And, you know, some of the things that are sometimes hard is slowing down eating. Also another habit that's sometimes hard is like listening to your body, stopping when you're satisfied and, um, like, uh, before moving on and before eating. And I think Mm -hmm. those are kind of in trained behaviors too. All right. Anybody else? We do have one, another one. Uh, She said, I need to lose another 75 pounds. I've lost 100, but I'm stalling. I think I'm eating too much crap again. Um, Well, Jackie, you you've came this far you've lost 100 pounds so first of all celebrate that because that's a pretty big deal (laughs) um and secondly if you feel like you are eating too much crap again then i would reach out to probably your bariatric program and see if they can put you in touch with a dietitian and maybe they can figure out exactly what it is that you're eating that could be stalling your progress right brenda yeah. Is there anything yeah. else you want to add to that? I would say like just keeping like a log, a food log of what you're eating. I know it's mm-hmm. really, sometimes it's a pain in the butt to do that because when you're trying to track, you know, everything that you're eating, but it does make you more mindful. It's like, okay, you can kind of look at, look at your days, um, look at a week, even if you're not really tracking to lose weight, you're tracking just to be able to see what you what your normal days are like and it can help you identify maybe what areas you can kind of tweak and change up to make it a little better yeah she said thank you (laughs) hopefully that'll help yeah i hope so too so i don't have anything else Brittany. do you no let me just double check facebook one more time because we have a uh, Tina said, I will be two years, July 18th. I've lost a hundred. Seems like I can't lose anymore. I gained two to six pounds, lose two to six pounds. Anything I need to do to get back on track. I mean, I, I, I hate to be repetitive, but I would say, you know, make sure you're tracking what you're, what you're eating and you know, kind of train your mind to be more mindful and just pay attention. And, um, you know, what's interesting is if you're, are you getting enough fluids in too? Because I mean, am I right, Brenda? (laughs) Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a good question. I think it's about like looking at, you know, what you're eating, like what types of foods are those Mm -hmm. keeping you full? Are you finding like the behaviors? Um, are you finding that, maybe you're eating really fast that you're eating in front of the TV so that you're not being really mindful. You don't even feel full. You're just like eating mindlessly. If you're um, grazing all day long, if you're emotional eating, I mean, some of those behaviors can be identified by like the writing it down. And that's why I'm saying it's, it's um, it can be helpful to have, to be able to do that. And if it takes somebody else looking at it, like I said, a a dietitian looking at your, what you're doing to kind of help you identify it, because sometimes it's hard. Sometimes we don't really realize that drinking, drinking a couple glasses of wine every evening or drinking a couple glasses of Starbucks or cups of Starbucks. Oh yeah. You know, sometimes there's like little hidden patterns that we don't see that really we don't think it would make a difference. But sometimes somebody else looking at what we're doing can help us identify where maybe our stalls are happening. You know, (laughs) let me check and see. She said lots of water and protein drinks. Okay. Open session. So helpful to get answers and. Um, Lisa said, thank you for this open session. So helpful to get answers, confirmation of questions and concerns. Absolutely. This is honestly, that's why we do these lives. We, if we had it this way, every time we would do it every time. (laughs) We love love this. We love when people ask questions and it makes it easier. We love when people comment too, because it makes it so much better for all of those involved, because a lot of people have the same kind of questions, maybe 
that you do. So a lot of I mean, people do. Yeah. Yeah. So simplifying it, you know, so looking at, I'd say if you're at a stall and you're wanting to know where to go next, you know, looking at um, your normal activities on a daily basis, you don't even have to try, quote, try to lose weight. I'd say just looking at what a normal day looks like, maybe writing down some of your goals of what you'd like to do. And um, if it's, if it's lose, maybe start brainstorming some ideas of small little action steps that you can take. Um, I know that sounds super simplistic, but maybe like, let's say you want to lose another 10 pounds, another 20 pounds, another 30 pounds, whatever it is, writing that down. And then thinking of little tiny steps that you can take to kind of move towards that. Because sometimes um, we know like our intuition, our own guidance will tell us what, what to do next. Um, and we just have to listen to ourselves, you know, like some of these people who were just talking said, I've been eating a lot of junk, but they're, you know, like, you know what you're doing, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what you're doing, but it's, it's a matter of sometimes like being really aware of that so that you know what, what, what changes to make. I hope that makes sense. I mean, it I makes sense to me, but yeah. <laughs> By writing it down, by journaling it, it helps you with identification of what it is so that you can like really look at what actions you can take to change it basically. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I think anything else, Brittany? No. Okay. Well guys, we're going to sign off here and Brittany, I'm going to call you after this, if that's okay. And absolutely. Um, well, we, we want to wish you guys a wonderful, happy day and we hope that um, we hope some of these little clues will help you be highly successful. All right. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks okay. for being here. Bye, Bye guys. Bye, Bye Gwen.